when you're thinking about something in a way before you actually experience it, it's going to completely change the way that it tastes to you. And um, I feel like that also applies to the marketing of, of the label too, you know, like hmm. you see that even before you pour it in the glass sure. and that leads to the beer experience. Welcome to Hen House Unruffled, an audio companion to the beers of Hen House Brewing Company. Each episode, we'll take a deeper dive into each beer's concept, recipe, can art, sensory, and more with your hen host, Fridge. What up? What's up, Unruffled listeners? It's Fridge, your host for the Hen House Unruffled podcast. And today, I'm joined by my Unruffled co hosts, Bob and Sayre as well as the always awesome art director here at Hen House Brewing Company, Josh Staples. And we're here to discuss our brand new celebrity lager, Indie Darling. Indie Darling is a Dortmunder export lager. This style is generally overlooked in the States, but we here at Hen House would like to change that. A Dortmunder export lager is often described as being more malt forward than a Helles lager and less hop forward than a Pilsner. Whatever the case, after one taste of Indie Darling, you'll be sure to say, that's one delicious drinker. Without further ado, let's get it going. You know that Indie Darling is on TikTok? I, I feel like at this point, TikTok is industry, not indie. I don't know where the indie kids hang out these days. Yeah, but like calling yourself indie is just a marketing ploy, isn't it? I mean, those of us from the 90s are going to jump over this table and fucking fight you now, Fred. <laughs> It was a big deal. Felt it. There was a time when that shit mattered, man. Like yeah. the independent film channel used to matter. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. remember Dinner for Five. Wow. Oh, I loved Dinner for Five. That was a great show. Mm-hmm. One of How my do favorites. you remember Dinner for Five? That was like too old Dude, for me. Dude, I was like 10 and I like knew way more about movies than freaking adults yeah, in that my was life. A, that was a John Favreau joint, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Absolutely. It wow. was. He is just... <sighs> Just like the golden goose, like that guy can do anything and, he, and make uh, something incredible. <laughs> it's true. He was the indie darling at one point for sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I remember an episode with Tarantino and um, Kevin Smith and I was like, dude, wow. like all my favorite people at a table right now. That's, like, Who are the other two? I wonder. Oh, do you God. remember? It's probably yeah. like Parker Posey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's, there's those combinations of things that. You think they wouldn't exist, and I'm from a little earlier on, so the '80s. Someone sent me once a video of, and it was a BBC, not not probably not BBC, but an English television show, and it was George Michael, Morrissey, and the dude who started the off the shore pirate radio in England. Ooh. It was those three yeah. guys, and their topics of discussion were everything but the girl, which is a band I love, Breakin' the movie, but it was called Breakdance in England, and um, Joy Division's. Substance album that came Dude. out. So you have wow. those three guys talking about those three. It was like how it couldn't be any more curated to me. Of course, look at the pirate radio guy is not really my thing, but everything else is a hundred percent like in my brain. So I'm, that is to hear George Michael praise Joy Division and Morrissey shoot them down was a revelation. I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> I mean, but also like now that we know those men as adults. Yeah. Pretty, pretty on brand for both Yeah, of those pretty. People. It makes one, sense one now. Is, one is happy and like, <laughs> willing to praise others, yeah. and the other is just pissed. <laughs> those types of things. When those are the cultural figureheads, they're all going to talk about one another. And when it's on a chat show in England, it's kind of no holds barred. It was pretty great. Yeah. That's so dope. I feel like there's been a, there's those those moments, like, it's almost always New York, right? They'll be mm-hmm. like, oh, it was the village at this time. Or it was like, there was the recent one with fucking Kanye and Madonna and. There's like two or three other ridiculous people, like in the in this room at this restaurant, and it was oh, yeah. just like a photograph that leaked with like no explanation of like why are all these people together. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a famous famous one for Edna Lewis, who's like the father of the mother, I should say, of African American cuisine and restaurants in this country, mm-hmm. and her restaurant in New York, and it's like I don't have it in front of me, but it's like Tennessee Williams, <laughs> like the prima ballerina of the New York ballet at the time and like some other just like icons in the back like smoking cigarettes in the like garden of her restaurant in New York. Yeah. yeah. It's I think there was also considerably less celebrities because there was only so many channels to see those folks. When there's thousands of actors it's hard to really 
curate who's in a room and even pay it, people aren't really paying attention to who else is in the room to them these days anymore like unless they're someone else instagram something in the same room right right <laughs> tags the location they're Collab. in they're not gonna Social know media. but <laughs> right yeah when you read books like that like i'm reading a book by chris franz who's the drummer of talking heads and a uh, terrible storyteller <laughs> <laughs> Terrible storyteller and very normy dude <laughs> who is very angry at David Byrne still. This book just Aww. came out and he does not like David Byrne still. But um, it's just a, all the people that were in one place at one time. It's just nuts. That whole yeah. CBGB time it's is like crazy. It's like before the advent of the like internet age. Like You needed something to bring the people you know, like a, a place for them to like meet at, like Studio Fifty Four yeah. or something. Yeah. Well, and CBGB, if you wanted to make sure, it in yeah. an industry, you got in your car and went there. Right. Yeah. 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 If but you wanted to be seen, you had to go get seen. Exactly. <laughs> you had to be somewhere where people could look at you, <laughs> not just in your house. And you got to know somebody, right? Yeah. Which is still true, but maybe to a lesser degree. Like I feel like there's a lot more like self-made internet celebrities these days that just like had a. Good yeah. Idea. Actually, I actually was. Not that, like, a couple years ago was in that argument pretty heavy between two, I'll leave their names out, but, like, DJs that matter. Mm -hmm. And one is still, like, in that 90s mode. Like, the reason all this shit sucks is because the industry wants people listening to dumb shit. And, like, <laughs> da, da 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 And, like, I just totally agree with the other guy who was like, really? Because I feel like the industry is literally just, like looking at YouTube and SoundCloud and like spotting trends that kids are already into. It's like if you look more at more democratic. The, yeah, yeah. And I mean, not necessarily like you can argue whether it's to a better end or not. Right. A&R's did a lot of whack shit, but like they also kind of like cultured and directed art and careers in constructive directions sometimes. And now it's just like kind of a free for all, you mm -hmm. know, but I do think there's like a, like I think the tail has wag is now wagging the dog, right? Like, People are like reacting to whatever kids latch on to. And maybe that's maybe I'm naive and that's being manufactured in some way I'm unaware of. But I mean, what it means to be a celebrity like has definitely changed over the last 20 years. Like the traditional like Hollywood celebrity, some would argue, doesn't exist anymore. Right. At least for like the film arena, mm -hmm. um, the film sector. Like, mm -hmm. we've got, like, Leonardo DiCaprio. A lot of people are like, he's, like, the last, like, real, like, Hollywood celebrity. I've heard that argument a million times. <laughs> it's just kind of, like, what is what does it mean to be, like, an indie darling in today's age? Is that something that's actually more on the internet, maybe? I mean, I would say in film, it's it's back, no? I mean, Film's, like, like, bifurcated, right? There's, like, big films and small films. Like, you almost have to be making a Marvel movie or endeavoring to be an indie darling at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you're... In a Marvel movie, I don't think that you can be like considered like an indie darling. In no, the no, spirit. that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Whereas I think that the origin of that term, and Josh probably know better than me, but the origin of that term in the film world was people who assuaged even making the like Grisham movie or like the mm -hmm. whatever the like adult movie that might make like tens of millions of dollars, but wasn't going to be the biggest movie of the year. But they were actually like. It was like almost a whole other track, right? It was showing up in different theaters. It was like... Sure. There was... I mean, there still is a little bit of an art house thing you can see happening, but it's pretty homogenized. You see the same 15 movies everywhere you go. Yeah. True. And that's the end. And I mean, some could say it's the same with music, really, even though it's there's smaller factions of people listening to more smaller music all the time. But as far as the big wigs, there's like 15, 20 in yeah. any given genre. Like, gone are the days of, like, the slow burn in the cinema. Like, you, you used to be able to just, like, take your movie to, you know, a city and, like, be like, okay, here we are. Like, like I was uh, watching, like, the movies that made us uh, on Halloween during, like, the last October. Oh, yeah. They would just, like, bring Eric it Stoltz somewhere else. And, like, darling. it, exactly. like, took time for that, like, momentum to build. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it was, like, a phenomenon. Like, that doesn't really happen anymore. Like, it... It all comes out all at once it, and these days, it seems. I mean, you see, you'll see something like sneaky things, like The Artist, a, a movie with no dialogue, with no actual spoken dialogue, will win Best Picture. And that was just, that was less than a decade ago, right? Am I tripping? And that was, that's an, a fully, strangely indie phenomenon. Like, that was wild. And when, when things do that, it's always a surprise. I mean, I think I would say Barry Jenkins was an indie darling. Moonlight? That was only like... Oh, yeah. Five years ago, yeah. right? I mean, mm -hmm. the, the whole A24 thing, which then became the neon thing. Is that the the one that did Parasite? The studio that did Parasite? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess I would argue that now that, that there's no middle, that there are small films mm -hmm. and there are people who are 
endeavoring to make a billion dollars. I guess that's more the feeling that I'm trying to convey, too. Yeah, it's like, you used to be able to watch these movies in the regular cinema. Now you have to go seek them out in a specialty cinema, you know? I do enjoy the, the weird dance that is, like, it has to be in theaters for it to be a Oscar-nominated picture, so they'll put something in theaters for, like, two weeks. Yeah, right. <laughs> like Power of the Dog or something like that, which is obviously a internet, you know, based company putting something on the streaming service, but right. fuck, I guess we got to throw it in a theater. It's going to be expensive. <gasps> Make all these digital packages, send them out, make people, you know, promote it. Spend so much money to get this thing to maybe win an Oscar. Right. Yeah. Campaigning. Well, I mean, the ridiculous one was the Scorsese film, right? Oh, like the a million Irishman? hours long. Yeah. <sighs> and they had yeah. to put it in theaters so that it could be nominated for Oscars. Right. Yeah. And some dude uh, over in, like, like Switzerland or Austria can do way better de-aging over a weekend than <laughs> <laughs> the best in Hollywood that has was, to offer. It was, impo- it was impossible to de-age, <laughs> de-age Robert De Niro, De Niro enough to make him not yeah. walk and move like an old man. You could smooth all the skin out you want, but, right? <laughs> but unless that kid's got problems or is really drunk, yeah. no one moves like that unless they're 65. Yeah. <laughs> He's got an old soul, yeah. for sure. And the old knees, for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> old discs. <laughs> well, anyways, we should probably reset and figure out where we're at here. We Why? <laughs> I think we were doing really well for Indy <laughs> Darling. But anyway, yeah, we're uh, we're here around the table. I'm super stoked to have Josh uh, Staples at the party oh, today. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you, man. It's been a while. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about your like direction when it came to creating the label for this new celebrity lager? We got a Dortmunder export here on the table. Yeah, well, this one is in keeping with all of the celebrity lagers we've done so far, we've tried to make them look like magazine covers. Well, we got a little bit of setting peeking around the edge of all these magazine covers, but this one we were thinking a little bit like interview, like I kind of ripped off the Andy Warhol interview title a bit, mm-hmm. gave that a, a painting treatment, and um, yeah, this interview never has any literally any text except for just the thing, just the word interview. So we kind of mixed it with some sort of fashion magazine. Originally it was all black and white, but we figured it was a little too drab on a shelf, so we put some color in there. Um, it's the first instance of a, not the first, but the first instance of a main white chicken. Yeah. A bleached white hen, <laughs> which is, we've had them, uh, we've had different colored chickens in uh, like, what was it? Matinee Idol has a couple extraneous strange chickens in <laughs> yeah. polo shirts um, but it, it's a really fun way to be able to i think treat this hen uh it's a, it's a different angle it's a it's a different look entirely i think it might still be the same hen it's hard to tell yeah. <laughs> they're all different i think um but the direction was kind of like a film magazine and kind of like a fashion magazine yeah i got a little bit of like a, a glamorous life vibe from this chicken too it's using the same type of look yeah and a little smoothed out Mm-hmm. And I mean, then, this hen wouldn't rock jewels like that. That'd be garish for an indie darling. Exactly. True. Yeah. True. <laughs> just, I just mean like the vibe of like the way the chicken's like looking at you, like like almost like a a model would or something. You know. Yeah. Yeah. There's so far there's a couple only a couple of those supermodel looks with the half closed eyelids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Glamorous life and in indie darling. And uh, I really love the sort of like like paintbrush style like uh, text. Um, oh, never seen you. that before for sure. That was new. That was something I, I, I was looking at interview, and uh, I just was like, yeah. how am I going to... There's no fonts that really look like this, so I just went in my backyard and threw some paint on some paper and came out nice. That's awesome. Yeah. And did you, like, photograph it to, like, then get it digital? Or? I did some scans. I just, on a flatbed scanner, just kind of rotated it a bunch. And oh, that I don't think I really took any cool. pictures. You know, I, I, I scanned it flatbed style. So this is why people listen to Unruffled, to get the behind the scenes. <laughs> how was it made? It's one of those giant pieces of paper taking up a lot of space in my office right now. I need to throw it on a wall and forget about it. <laughs> but I'm pretty pleased with how it came out, especially seeing in the hallway here. It's just our own personal hallway here, but it's we have all of the celebrity loggers on over by Michael's office there. Check them out. Just you guys, not, you know. Yeah, we won't show anyone yeah. else. Don't <laughs> worry. Keep that. Yeah. It's yeah, an employee's only area. It's an employee's only area. Yeah, yeah, don't go sneaking around <laughs> looking for it. Yeah. I could take the microphones up to it so the <laughs> audience can uh, yeah. and then hear describe the posters. It. Hear it, exactly. <laughs> Or just collect them all when you grab the labels, you know? There you go. Um, I know this is a little off topic, but we just had your anniversary post go up. And oh, yeah. there was a commenter that said, like, man, my freaking, like, walls are covered in, in his art. I love this guy. And I was saying, I was like, oh, man, your wife must be upset about that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Let's be real. A dude's probably single. <laughs> That's usually when people are like, I got my fridge covered up and I know that person's married. I'm yeah. like, what is it? <laughs> it smells a lot like old beer and adhesive in this yeah. hallway. <laughs> Better not be old beer if he's a Hen House fan. Oh, well, yeah, I just mean... Spilled you know, beer. Spilled beer, beer yeah. Exactly. When he's, when he's got the label off and he's got the can in his hand and he twists it and dumps it on himself. <laughs> I'm there. I've been there. Been there. Yeah. yeah. 100%. <laughs> Smells like spilt very fresh beer. Yeah. I don't know. I can think of any like other like local examples of a Dortmunder. Um, I was just thinking about that uh, this week with this beer coming out. Nothing jumps to mind with me. Maybe Dempsey's was working on one, oh, you know, 19 years ago. Um, and then, I don't think Dempsey's could do lockers. Yeah. Then yeah. Probably Sudwork and Davis. I mean, you think they did someone else? Are, we, on this are too? we? I mean, you know, they don't exist anymore. But <laughs> if we're going to talk about Dortmunders, Dead Canary. Yeah, Dead Canary. Is that a, that's from a Dortmund Republic. Yeah, that was a. Oh yeah, that was a that was a game changing beer for me. But I think we should go back a little more because um, Bob, you can probably speak to this. Like, this is a style that every beer judge contestant, every aspirant Cicerone had to read about and probably couldn't drink unless you wanted to drink an ancient, oxidized, <laughs> warm-stored bottle. Yeah. Like, I ran a beer program at a bar that endeavored to have the entire beer spectrum for the world, mm-hmm. and I believe we carried one Dortmunder, and the bottles were ancient and gross. Like, this <laughs> is not a style that even really serious beer geeks, prior to the last five years of craft breweries making them, and even then, as Fridge points out, it was pretty rare, this is not a style you're likely to have encountered. Totally. Yeah, usually, you know, to find this beer brewed by one of these breweries, you have to be at a store that does a lot of either just a ton of alcohol. So, like, everything's there. And I don't mean, like, your well-stocked corner liquor store. I mean a place that, you know, has, just sells booze but also has shopping carts. So when you mm-hmm. travel the whole place or a place that's just like, we get all kinds of crazy crap from all over the world that wasn't made in America Check this out. If you want, like, some funky, like, pseudo-African mask that was, in fact, stamped out of a factory in China, <laughs> that, and then all this weird, just European I don't think food. Cost Plus is an account. You can just say their name. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know people know. We all know. We're, you know. Or the Tommy's joints of the world that are like, we have 100 beers from all over the world. Yeah. And, but this one that no one ever orders has been here for five years. Well, now, fuck. That is an account, so... And uh, I love them. <laughs> no, delete that. Uh, so we should name... Uh, you might be able to come across the, a Dortmunder at Soup and Kuka in the sure. city, which isn't far from Tommy's Joint, and... Bevmo. Uh, Bevmo, and uh, Schroeder's. Schroeder's is another German beer hall in San Francisco. We're good. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Covered. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever had a Dortmunder before this one. I don't think I've ever had a Dead Canary. Oh, wow. So... so um, yeah, Dead Canary was um, a brewery that we handled the distribution for for a couple of years. Uh, Old Republic was. Old Republic was yeah. the brewery. Dead Canary right. was the, their flagship beer, which was a Dortmunder lager. I first encountered them dropping off samples in 22-ounce bottles to Hogs Apothecary, which I can mention because it doesn't exist anymore, in probably 2000 and. 12, 13, 14, something like that. I didn't taste the samples because they were in 22s. And Curtis, who uh, worked for us at Hogs at that point, uh, who has gone on to sell beer for Berryessa Brewing Company, whose uh, wife sells beer for Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, was like, no, 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 no. Old Republic is really good. You should taste those. And I was like, really? And so we brought out these 22-ounce bottles. I had to locate a bottle opener, <laughs> crack them Did open. Did you just use your, like, Bic lighter in your pocket? Come on. I don't smoke. Oh, I use, okay. I use a hard drive to keep in my desk just for this. It serves no purpose to open bottles. I use yep. dead media to open yeah. dead media. Um, and uh, cracked them open, and it was just one after another. Like, And they were all these styles that you just couldn't sell. It was like, this is our like uh, Irish red ale. And this is right, our, like, right. you know, it, which, which, like, again, Bob, like, it was so obvious these dudes were BJCP guys. Yeah. Right? It was like, oh, you are brewing to, like, styles in a book because, <laughs> yeah. um, you know. <laughs> Long live Killian's Irish Red, but I don't right. think anybody had tasted one of those in quite some time either. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were all just extremely delicious beers. And so, you know, I started, like like a lot of our early distribution partners, I harassed Colin to pick them up so I could buy them and sell them at the bar that I was running. And, you know, Old Republic eventually, you know, went from self-distribution to henhouse distribution, and we were carrying them. Old Republic also gave us McLean, our San Francisco account rep. He All was right. uh, he worked for them as an account rep. Um, I do remember that. Yeah. I, right when I got hired, uh, he was still working for them, and then pretty shortly after that, he came over to the team. Yeah. He was, like, the shortest person hired at the time from 
getting hired to the company party. Oh, he got that award. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good timing. Yeah. But anyways, I think their expression of Dortmunder, it's not an export. So as with a few other styles, export connotes a stronger beer that had the ability to travel a little more. So their lager was like 4.8. Indie Darling here is 6% alcohol. Uh, I would even say this is probably a couple SRM darker than that beer. Um, True. That beer really, you know, unless you were being very geeky about it, would just have shown up in your glass as a Pilsner. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd be like, oh, this is a Pilsner, you know, and then maybe if someone talked to you into it, you could be like, oh, there's some more minerality or something like that. This beer here really, you know, like, I don't know, it was this like early Cicerone level. The thing you had to say about a Dortmunder was like, it's a beer with the hop character of a Czech lager, but the malt character of a Bavarian Hellas. That was the thing you like had to say to act yeah. like you knew what a Dortmunder was. And that's actually, I think, what we've got in front of us here, plus with about like a, a full you know, additional percent of alcohol. Mm-hmm. So it's just like a, a bigger, bolder. It's probably the, the most full-flavored beer in the celebrity lager family. Yeah, I mean, it's super um, bold and, and rich and, and the aroma off of it, like... I don't often like use malt as like an aroma note, but I'm like really getting malt in the aroma on this, mm-hmm. and I I love it. And I, honestly, like all the Hellases that I've experienced, I feel like they're a little lighter when compared to this, and I like that this is a little bit paler, richer. paler in color, or yeah, less a heavy little on bit, the palate. a little bit lighter in color, a little yeah. bit more pale in color. Um, yeah, there's some honey to this, which implies a little cooking. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, some touch of commonization going on, but. Uh, I do take it back, too, because then I, I was hearing you talk about Dead Canary, and I'm pretty sure I tried that beer, but I definitely tried a Dortmunder from Redwood Curtain back in the day. Mm-hmm. They had one, I think it was called Deutmunder or something like that, and they're probably the first time I ever saw that beer as like a beer buyer and experienced it. I always thought they made amazing stuff, and they also introduced me to the Alt Beer, too. Their Dusseldorf Alt Mm, Beer was really mm. good, too. Probably some BJCP judges running around that brewery, too, it sounds like, (laughs) right? So, huge shout-out to everyone checking in Old Republic beers in 2022. Youch. Are you just trolling untapped right now? Best of luck. I was trying to think of some of their other beers, and Black is a beer from Old Republic that I really loved. That was was the one I was trying to think of, which, shout-out to Ed W. (laughs) for the beer you enjoyed 11 days ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dark beers hold up, but uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh-oh. Ed, Ed so w is, dare I say, the indie darling of uh, <laughs> Untapped right now. Yeah. We, we should probably note, Old Republic closed about two years ago. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that a... beer is a historical artifact. Yeah, and that beer is not a 12% Imperial Stout you sit down in your closet. Yeah. Um, black, is, black is too light to go this long. <laughs> I don't know what this guy's drinking. <laughs> but it's... Um, it's troubled me. Everyone at this table can see that Bob is troubled right now. <laughs> Some people do get confused. I'll occasionally go see, when was the last time that Henhouse beer was brewed and someone just drank this beer that hasn't been brewed and never even came out in a can since 2014? Hmm. Just the other day, I'm like, I don't think, I think you're a liar. That's like, not possible, <laughs> man. Yeah. You, would you save it in your hands? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jar or something? Like, we didn't even have crowlers exactly. then, man. Yeah, you must have just... Right. Took it to go. I'm just going to take this to go. <laughs> my thermos. Kept it in my pocket. <laughs> saved it for later. It's like Beetlejuice. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Save that for yeah, later. Just put a, a sponge down and just squeeze it when you get home. <laughs> that might be what some of these people do. I'm sorry. Like, I, I derailed the whole conversation, but also in, my internal monologue has been completely derailed as well. <laughs> this whole experience. But this is a like this is a lovely example of this beer. It's one of those other great pale lagers that isn't a Pilsner, but was something that was devised to keep that local brewing culture relevant when Pilsner was coming to sweep them into the dustbin of history. And they're like, no, we can do that too. Like Golden Lager. Gotcha. We should slow that down because I think that's crazy important. And I, well, okay, I'll give you my useful imagined version of circumstances Mm -hmm. and you can kind of fact check me if you want, but this has always been useful for me for understanding what happened to beer around that moment. Like the advent of pale malt and Pilsner malt, like which can happen because you can use indirect heat. You don't need to have a flame near the malt to dry it out. Um, Literally just changed everything. And I've seen it blamed for triples becoming pale. Sure. And then you see like this thing that started in Pilsen, where the name comes from. And then you see all these other brewing centers basically scramble to come up with or create a style that they could show to someone and have them be like, oh, that's one of those new... Right. Pale beers. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which there's an interesting parallel to what's gone on with Haze, right? Yep. 
right? Like, like I imagine, and I imagine it just being so much more revelatory, right? Like if yeah. every beer you've ever seen is a little turbid and a little dark and a little caramelized for your entire life. a little life, smoky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's this crystal clear thing that looks like champagne. You're like, this is beer? Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And like, yeah. I think every one of those moments when people ask that exact question based on the visual was impactful. Even if take it all the way to like the things 450 North does now with yeah. the stuff that looks like, you know, fruit puree or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really amazing. Blowing people's minds visually yeah. is how you kind of send everybody back to the lab or mm -hmm. back to the brew house in this case. Mm -hmm. And not every historic brewing place had the same vapid water that Pilsen had, had, you know, in many of the things that made Pilsner Pilsner. So you get in a place where you are not allowed to use lager yeast, you get Kolsch, right? In mm. another place where the water is incredibly mineral rich, you get Dortmund. Yeah. Um, and named after the town that's right. got that rich water. Exactly. So that's what exactly. makes a Dortmund is that it's from Dortmund. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. And, and I think there's there's probably a million examples like this. Absolutely. The water in Burton on Trent goes great with British hops. And that was a boom. Then you got IPA. Yeah. I, I love that uh, visual subject, you know, because I was just having a little like Sunday lunch party with some friends and we were all sitting around and we made this like really bright green pesto pasta and we had like a super like uh, cool green colored like Caesar salad and um, I had like a like a honey ginger thyme like chicken thigh that I barbecued that had like the thyme like that was little green pieces on it it was the first day of spring mm -hmm. and we were just like talking about the color of the food and how like that impacts the way we're tasting it and mm -hmm. I was reflecting at the table like yeah I mean I kind of learned that from beer like we drink things with our minds well before we drink them with our mouths you know you see something you smell something you expect something before you even put it in your mouth and you taste it for the first time and then when you taste it that whole experience leading up to that moment has led you to the flavors that you're about to, to experience and, and it, it impacts it, you know, mm -hmm. when you're thinking about something in a way before you actually experience it, it's going to completely change the way that it tastes to you. And, um, I feel like that also applies to the marketing of, of the label too, you know, like hmm. you see that even before you pour it in the glass sure. and that leads to the beer experience. And I just think it's neat. <laughs> well, I think it puts a lot of pressure on what Josh does here. Uh, yeah, I've, I've relieved myself of that pressure. <laughs> <laughs> For the most part. But you can either choose to placate those expectations or fuck with them, right? Uh, this is the whole idea of the celebrity lager thing, right? Is mm -hmm. For a long time, the way you marketed a traditional continental lager was you named the beer that style and you had a label that looked like our heritage label. Yep. Right. You know? And mm -hmm. it was like... It was like, this is for mature beer drinkers who know what they like, and here is our Kolsch. It Enjoy is the it. default way of thinking. And we, yeah. I mean, that's why we did it with our Kolsch, and we did and it Pilsner with our first. Pilsner, and we yeah. did it with, mm. and we started at least naming beers that were a wit beer. It wasn't just called wit beer, it was called clocked out, you know? Yeah. yeah. So we did start at least branching out there, and that led us to be like, why are we using this stodgy kind of format for these beers that are actually very exciting? Like, we should be making exciting modern labels for these great, you know, tried and true tested styles but i also love nostalgia too right and like you get that nostalgia feeling when you have a heritage label on a hen house beer for me i'm like ah, oh, yeah i remember when pilsner looked like this right you know and just seeing clocked out coming out and it still has that style of label just makes me happy i like playing with that style of the label too we're still making a lot of those looking you know those yeah. kind of oval labels with the with the slanted Mm -hmm. lines and just white and silver and a little accent color. We still make those. We're, we've got brand new ones coming out all the time. Yeah. Love it. I love it's, it. It's fun. But yeah. that, it, for like Fest Life and that kind of stuff, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I was Our, really... Yeah, go ahead, Bob. I was really like... I was so upset at the idea of like losing Pilsner and then, you know, I was like, but that isn't how you sell these kinds of beers. Then I literally said to Sarah, I was like, is it that that isn't how you sell these kinds of beers or no one has tried to give someone as much fun as all of our Ripple labels are in a light locker, in a crispy boy, in something mm -hmm. crushable and delicious, where the flavor isn't screaming at you, so why have the can scream at you as well? But you're mm -hmm. like, no, 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 I want my can screaming at me. I want all the art, I want all the jokes, I want all the fun in there. And it's been neat to see how these have been received. 100%. Which 
presentation would you guys say is more accessible? That's a tricky question because, like, who is the the major buyer of our brand, right? You know, is it a bunch of, like, old-timers that really appreciate that kind of thing? I'm guessing. I mean, maybe the old-timers appreciate the new style, too. I mean, every point on the graph is represented, right? Venn diagrams here. But I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. You know, I don't know that anyone can really claim to know the answer to that unless they have the data, like, right in front of them, you know? Yeah, I bet, I mean, we probably do have that data somewhere. Are, are these, like, celebrity loggers, which, I mean, we also wanted to make more than one Pilsner, so we started making more Pilsners and started branding them differently. So that it wasn't just, wait, I thought your Pilsner was called Pilsner. That's not a very exciting <laughs> right. thing for beer. <laughs> right. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so I think that having different looks for beers, I mean, it does give you the opportunity to really connect with something more than just having the heritage label. Like if, for instance, one of these heritage labels we just made with Crosby coming up, it's got a, and we'll talk about it, I'm sure, when it comes out, but it's got a kind of a golf theme because it's like label. the Crosby, is because Crosby's the hop company that we do a lot of business with, and they're yeah. wonderful. And then they, uh, because it's like a pro-am beer, we're calling it that because we want to have home brewers do something with it, and it's fun. We actually chose chose the Bing Crosby pro-am golf as the theme. We're gonna have some golf fans buying that beer up just because yeah. it look it's got golfers on it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally. So I mean that people can connect with things when they are specific. Mm-hmm. Maybe everyone can connect with something when it's generic, but when it's specific, it it means a lot to a small amount of people. It's either everyone or no one. Exactly. When yeah. it's generic, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like. Like, does everyone connect with like the most generically presented multi meal cereals or something? You know, like, mm-hmm. like, is that accessible to everyone or is that like accessible to no one? Does no one feel as though they're being targeted? It's got to be like the Cheerios label or something, right? Just like that classic yellow. I mean, like, just thinking like, what's the most basic cereal box in the aisle? You know? Well, I know there's nostalgia for that as well, especially mm-hmm. if you're a kid who is like who got the big bag cereal at the bottom of the shelf. That's your height for. That they, yep. It's not just because it's it's that your height for a reason. It's the most right. fun looking cereal on the shelf. One hundred percent. And it's a big old bag, so um, people are very nostalgic for that kind of thing and. Even though it is pretty generic. Like, it's actually generic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember when I first started in the marketing department, we did a uh, virtual thing with Cloudwater um, in the UK. And we had to create a uh, virtual tour video. Mm-hmm. This was one of my like, first projects in, uh, in my job as a marketing coordinator. And there's a, a piece towards the end of that 16, 17 minute long video, which is way too long, um, <laughs> uh, the virtual tour that we created uh, where Colin is talking about like how we make beers that uh, we, he was, you know, appreciating you. And then he was saying like, Josh is genius. And, you know, like it's really clear with the marketing of the labels, like we have some beers that are made for more of an entertainment purpose. And we have other beers that are, you know, at the time, at least more of a idea of like, just give me a beer kind of a beer. And like I edited it in like, like dark side of the rainbow Mm -hmm. for the, like the entertainment piece. And then I did like Kolsch and clocked out, I think for the, like, just give me a beer, beer. So Mm -hmm. like those heritage labels, you know, they are accessible, Yeah. but I feel like at our heart, like accessibility and getting it out to everyone is like one of our North stars. So like people who really know us, like, even if we do have a really specific reference, like they know that the liquid is still accessible in, in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, all, all but is a label that just says Kolsch accessible if you have no idea what that means? What Kolsch means? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. It took me drinking a Kolsch to really knew. I mean, to seeing, and I, the reason I got into Kolsch, which was one of my favorite styles of beer, was from that nostalgic looking classic Reisdorf bottle that you see. Right. Or Reisdorf tap handle that you see. And I was like, I like the look of that. That looks very German and clean right. and mm. traditional. I'll have that. I was fortunate I did because. There's all kinds of cultures that I don't like as much, but that one is still, I think, one of the best examples of that beer. And because it looked like a nostalgic German thing and tastes like a very nostalgic German thing, right. it's, uh, it does, it works. I think with all of our heritage labels, it did communicate that this is, to the person who says, like, that kind of isn't with craft beer on this whole fun journey of flavor, but is, like, excited about, like, local products or something. I'm thinking of, like... An older person who's just like, just give me a beer, beer. Right. And when you see that label, you're like, yep, that's what that is. And then there's a chance you might get like a clocked out and be like, oh, God damn it. This is like one of those craft beers. <laughs> um, but to a lot of people whose first beer might have actually been a really hazy IPA, this, all of our 
all of our lagers look like one of those beers, but they may, in fact, be crispy kids. They just don't know that they are yet until they get one of these. And so this is like, this is an enticing thing to them. This is fun. This is like what modern beer is like. This is the party that craft beer is. This is the the, the kind of brewery where you go to our brewery and then like two or three other breweries and that's like a killer Saturday for you and all your friends. Mm -hmm. So these labels, I definitely think speak to that younger market. And then if you're just really cool, if you're like 70 and just like cool as shit. Um, and I know a lot <laughs> Which, of like, There are a lot of them. I mean, yeah. Dude, yeah, in, in this, this region, yeah. absolutely freaking lootly. Yeah. Well, it's also nothing was more marketed than beer to somebody who's in their 50s right now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like beer used to be Beer commercials, it was beer commercials and cigarette commercials. Yeah. Were like, and car commercials were mm -hmm. it, you know? Man, I don't see any beer commercials anymore. Is it legal or no? Seltzer. <laughs> yeah, legal. Yeah, all all those all those I guess I do see yeah. some Corona yeah, yeah. commercials with Snoop Dogg. Yeah, <laughs> I do right, see those. Right, right. <laughs> right, right. That's about it, we were, we were literally, like, just talking about this about the Super Bowl, too. Yeah. You know, like, yep. at the Super Bowl, there was, like, <laughs> not very many or any beer commercials. Yeah, right? I actually think some of those Snoop Dogg commercials end with Corona Hard Seltzer. Do they, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I mean, I, I have the Lowenbrow theme memorized, and I never had a Lowenbrow until. I mean, do they make it anymore? They must. It's a classic. Oh yeah, somebody else. It's owns a classic. That shit. Yeah. Let it be Lowenbrow. You Shoot, know, like, <laughs> 1997 or whatever, like the Cowboys game. I remember seeing the Bud Weiser, oh, like yeah. frogs. Right. Like, right. I love that when I was. So a there's kid. no, yeah, there's no kids. like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no lack of fun yeah. in Spuds McKenzie or the WhatsApp guys <laughs> yeah. or the fucking hot, those frogs, yeah. right? And so. To think that, like, if you want to make beer for adults or you want to make beer for people who don't want their beer to have put on a fireworks show on their palate, it should be presented as though it's staid and boring is actually, to me, entirely counter to the way beer has always lived in this country. Yeah, those, like, those are Bud commercials. Take a look at Bud's label. That's That's been the same for couple hundred years but it's yeah. not subtle there's more <laughs> words on a budweiser commercial than like bob writes oh, right right I don't know, it's like true. a budweiser label there's that like whole band on the, the original top yeah. Dr. Bronner's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, dude, to uh, all about dr bronner's <laughs> and those labels yeah. yeah i love just looking going with this guy is a psycho yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is like what you used to do in the bathroom before for smartphones were right, <laughs> like, right. It's like, before iphones were waterproof yeah so i just true. used to read the bronner's <laughs> labels all the time but i do love like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is religious somehow, yeah. and also secular somehow. I don't know. This is the Israeli astronomer man. did speak to all of us that we are all one. None can be separate from the whole. The whole is the one thing. Like I've read that a lot of times. <laughs> yeah, and I got that goo soaking into my skin right now. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, why is this in the bathroom of the uh, woman in Rio Nido who's teaching me pottery right now? That's right. The old, that makes sense. That's the only kind of soap they would have yeah, in that pottery demo class in Rio Nido. Yeah. Articulated yeah. Dr. Brown. I know, but she's demo. Like, definitely like all about, like, she's got like a Wiccan book over here and like, <laughs> Wait, what's up with this Dr. Bronner stuff? This seems yeah. a little this secular. Is contrary to yeah. Your yeah. Wiccan beliefs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all one. Shout out all to, one. to Teresa. Right. You <laughs> are hope painting you're doing a well. picture. <laughs> I've been in that bathroom. Um, but I do want to say, like, I really love that, like, point that you brought up, Bob, how it's almost like the the converse or like the antithesis of like a younger uh, market person coming in and and like sure. being more experienced with the hazy IPAs is like, what is beer? Right. And then seeing this and learning that they like actually more of a of a lighter crispy boy or a, a, an older style, um, it's almost like can label uh, reverse psychology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so what I didn't want to do, what I was really sure I didn't want to do on a lager side, and I saw this starting to bubble, and I'm kind of glad to say I haven't seen it like take hold. But when the crispy boy phenomenon really hit, a lot of those beers were being presented using like techniques, like triple decocted or double decocted or you know all these things yeah. right. like like we use hops on our ipas right and that to me is alienating right like i barely know what some of that shit means you know so there's no way yeah. the vast majority of our customers do right and particularly when you're making beer in the tradition of the most popular beer style in the history of the world why put things on the label that like you need to be a certified Cicerone to understand. But totally. I'm reading the Indie Darling label saying, I, I don't even understand some of these things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's not like, 
the the headline isn't that right like right like i like hopefully in this and we should go through these because this is this is where i need like a boss to stop me from doing some of this shit but we <laughs> did we got real real dumb on this one but that's the fun thing about this these magazine labels and i think that was when it we is so fun. came up with the idea for star turn to make it a like what can we do to make this thing interesting it's if they're celebrity what is celebrity is all about is really all about magazines and i mean you can't really represent television on a beer without it and have it be that interesting but magazines are where it's at it's yeah. where it stays i mean that is a that's in print so it's there for i mean it's well, especially because these cans go to the grocery store right yeah and that magazine rack at the grocery store still exists yeah. still there still there yeah. yeah and the example i used when we were first talking about these was i forget i think her name's vanessa and she was dating kyle kuzma who's a basketball player I don't even care about, but I know who he is because he's a basketball player. And then I knew who she was because she was apparently like seen spotted out with him or something like that. And I was like, why do I know this? <laughs> like, I don't care about him. Like, you know, like he comes in and then the Warriors cook him and I laugh at him and like, cool. But like, that's his, that's his entire role in my life. So why do I know that he was out to dinner with this chick that I also don't know why she's famous? Right. But, like, I know, and, it, and it's that the nature of celebrity where you just can't, like, avoid it, yeah. you know? Like, oh, it's it's yeah. in your, it's literally, you, you can't help but to look at it. But you're going to look at either some Snickers or you're going to look at what's in those headlines. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And sometimes on the Snickers labels, like, they have fun words. When they change the names yeah. up, yeah, it's pretty, it, it's know, pretty, uh, it's great. Can't market. get entertaining <laughs> for, for a brief moment. But, yeah, it is insidious, that, that freaking magazine rack. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. pulls you I'm always like, oh no, what's happening to that person I like? And who are everybody else on this thing? I don't know. <laughs> right. And the queen? Really? No, probably yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, honestly, the the next level of celebrity is like, yeah, the royals. Yeah. Right? Like in yeah. America, we I have was that thinking so of for them, us in celebrities, like, yeah, right? Yeah, when you were just talking about Ooh, maybe, yeah, like, maybe that's the why next Why do I even care about celebrity the royal family? Some, sort of, some like royal family scandal. Yeah, vibe. some sort of yeah, some sort of Royals vibe. We haven't done anything like that in a magazine. Oktoberfest. That's pretty fun. Oh Oktoberfest my god. Oktoberfest is Royals. Wedding of the Century, but the 19th century. <laughs> Dude, Wedding of the Century Oktoberfest is pretty strong. Yeah. That's super strong. We're all going to circle back on this. So yeah, we do we, No, seriously, we do the whole chuck and die treatment for Teresa and whoever the groom was. My, That's a great my idea. pottery teacher. Yes, does everyone sure. realize? <laughs> does everyone realize that Bob just pulled the name of the bride in the wedding at the first Oktoberfest? <laughs> oh, doesn't everybody do know that? <laughs> Holy shit! No, Bob. Because the cause plot the, twist: my pottery teacher Teresa is the same woman. She's a Wiccan. She lives forever. She lives yeah, because it was called the. It was originally called like Teresa and Weissen. Uh, which means like Teresa's Meadow, and that's where the party was. Now it's just called the Vison. Man, everyone's really? looking. I'm just like, yeah, your car runs oh. on gasoline. Everyone's looking yeah. at me like, <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. I never think that Can we just, most like, people don't yeah. know that. Bob, impressive. Sorry. Good work, Bob. Wow. Yeah. I'll drink to that. Yeah. And it was, I used to know the dude because it was the wedding of. I mean, it's the, it's the dude who, oh, you know. What was his name? Um, his family yeah. owned Munich. But Frederick or something? I don't know. But yeah. It could totally, it almost certainly, I'm going to say it almost certainly is Frederick. It's yeah. been a minute. Yeah. It's been a minute. It's, it's got to be like I'm annoyed, what other name I'm is I'm annoyed. There. Whatever, whatever Jay-Z lyric I kicked out of my brain because I know that I'm pissed. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, it's good to have you guys back. I, I was, I did a pod, last podcast. I just, none of the regulars. Oh. And now I'm in here. <laughs> yeah. But, casting wedding of the century. Yeah. Yeah. And also a great group like that, that last podcast that I listened to, I'm not sure when these are all dropping, but the last one that I listened to was just like it sounded like a great posse cut because we got like all these different voices that I wasn't <laughs> expecting you know mm -hmm. I mean normally I mean I knew I wasn't there um, and I wasn't going to be hearing myself but yeah it was like you know it was like I knew the hit and like oh here's the remix with all the other guys uh, yeah. and gals jumping on it loved that and then uh, speaking of gals jumping on it I really loved the well actually episode um, me too huge yeah. shout to uh, Annalisa Ashland and Chelsea for putting it down on that one yeah it was great indeed so, okay, concepting. Let's let's run down the celebrity family at this point. Mm -hmm. We have, you guys want me to Star Turn was the Ridge. Yeah. 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 yeah, Star Turn Star was the OG. Turn, and that was Matt Pilsner. That's a, that's a, that's a, Star yeah. Turn's a regular Pilsner. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't mean it's an ex exceptional Pilsner. And the very <laughs> next one was Matinee Idol. Matinee Idol. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is a corn lager, Mexican-style yeah. corn lager. I really enjoyed making that media for the the pump on that one. That's oh, some yeah. of, that's That's probably the, well, no. I have a gold standard celebrity one that is entirely predictable if you know me. <laughs> uh, 
But is that the next one, or is the I next one? I think the next one was Glamorous Life. Glamorous Life. Which yeah. Is, yeah. 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 To me. So good. Yeah. yeah. That's my, that was my beer of the year on the beer of the year podcast. Like, mm-hmm. and it's coming back around soon. Shouts mm-hmm. to Wes for donning the Prince outfit for those photos. There oh, are yeah. rumors that that beer will be purple this year. Ooh, I hope so. I hope so. That would be really yeah. nice. Yeah. Really would. It, it comes... Is Butterfly Pea Flower now allowed? Or no? <laughs> That's a whole, it's, it's, that'll, that'll be the Glamorous Life podcast. Okay. It's always been allowed. But whether you, what you have to do to put it in your beer is complicated. I see. Okay. Well, that's a that's a sensory first Mike Guilford question. Oh yeah, we um, love to figure out complicated all the way things down here. That. We do. And then I'm, it was weekly beer name generator. Weekly beer name generator. Yep. I almost forgot. Yeah, the Doppelbach. Yes. Mm-hmm. And now here we are with Indie Darling. Yeah. So we got five celebrity loggers. One more, I think, in the offing, hopefully before the end of this year. And I would love, like, a, an assessment of how this has gone. Like, are yeah. people responding to it differently than they are with other lagers? Are people seeing these labels that are so stylized and then kind of disappointed that the beers are rather mellow? Although, you know, Generator would be an exception to that. Sure. It's, it is not mellow. Yeah, it's one of those things where, like, it's got so many conceptual layers that I really enjoy. Like, we were talking about yeah. the, the references on this label and stuff like that. But, like, you know, does it matter if, no, if anyone gets it? I don't know. Makes me happy. I'm happy about it. I I, th- I think it's strong marketing. Um, I don't often hear people talking about it. I do think that maybe we need like another year of them coming out for it to like really like get into people's heads. You know, it's not uh, as frequent as the conspiracy Ripa series, so like those come around a lot more often, and that's like really firmly in people's minds when they associate like the brands at Hen House. So I think time will tell, and maybe it's still a little too early. Like you said, we may have another one coming out before the end of the year. So Yeah, I love it. I love giving people that that extra part. You know, I just, like I've been saying, introducing a bunch of brand new team members to like what we do and where our focus is. Like, you know, it's Bazooka Joe Bubblegum. The most important thing is the gum. Um, our beer is way better than that gum is as gum. <laughs> <laughs> but throwing in this little extra thing, I truly believe it is a great thing to give to people. And anytime you're like, I think of someone cracking this beer while they're making dinner and, you know, maybe they're single and they're just like, they're like, yeah, sauteing something. And they're like, no, oh, uh, drinking pills making you chug. What? Man, I love pills. How dare they call me chug? Like, I love <laughs> that. And then you're me and you're like, what the hell is a chug? And you yeah. look it up on the internet and now I... I'm 48. I know what a chug is. Right. <laughs> I never looked at TikTok. Yeah. Right. I had the same reaction. I was like, what victory. is a schwig? <laughs> right. is this old, it has to be an old beer term, of course. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's kind of what I thought at first, too. Yeah. My favorite thing on this is the, uh, sir, <laughs> the SRM 6 when straw becomes gold. Certified beer Judd's Rumpelstiltskin weighs in. Yeah, and I was... That killed Because you have to not but, only be a super beer geek, you have to know... Uh, <laughs> folklore, what's you know? The, what, what are their names? The brothers? The Rumpelstiltskin? Uh, the Brothers Grimm? Is that a Brothers Grimm? May not be. I yeah. don't know if that's a Brothers yeah. Grimm tale or not. But anyways, yeah, he had the, he made straw. And, no, someone did it for him, right? I don't uh, remember <laughs> Rubber Stills can very well. <laughs> so, I can tell. Yeah. There's a horror film I want you to watch <laughs> yeah. that'll explain this. <laughs> so uh, when we're talking about beer, we talk about beer in color, and that color is determined by this complicated thing where are like looking at a beer under blue light, and uh, that's called the standard uh, reference method. That has a number, how much blue light can like pass through your beer has a number, then that number has a color associated with it. And then straw is more pale than gold. If you can hold in your mind the idea of like a piece of gold jewelry and, the, and a piece of straw, the straw is a lighter yellow than the gold is. So Rumpelstiltskin, who was like a little like demon thing. Or, or who, Billy Bartley, or however you remember, Billy, yeah, Billy Bartley I, was my Rumpelstiltskin. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Billy Barty was everybody's everything. Man. That, that guy was the, was the hardest working little person in Hollywood for like 55 yeah, years. Was His career champ. was incredible. The um, king. You know, well, we get to live in like the Warwick Davis era, but before there was a Warwick Davis, there was oh, yeah, Billy no. Barty. Yeah, Billy yeah, Barty Billy doing Barty. Play. everything now we're everywhere. Yeah. Is he the, the cameraman in UHF? Yes. Yep. Yes, he is. Yeah. And good work. Very good. He was he was the uncle to a woman I worked with at the music coop. Also Who? dope. Jessica. Huh. Anyway, yeah. But she, yeah, I was, that was uh, but she told me that Billy Barty was her uncle. I was like, are you She was two and a half feet tall and had magic powers. <laughs> yeah. I don't nice to re- not remember working yeah. with her, but it was her side gig because she was spinning straw into gold <laughs> yeah. on the side. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Was he also in the uh, Masters of the Universe? Was that him? Was that Billy Barty? I, I believe think it that is. was. Oh, yeah. I believe that is him. The Cosmic Key! Let's yeah. not talk yeah. about the Masters <laughs> of the Universe movie, please. Well, what about when 
Goldie Hawn beat the crap out of him in a foul play. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a good one. That's a good go. reference. Yeah. It's probably fine. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and at some <laughs> so point, the standard reference method. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Rumpelstiltskin is a character from folklore who spun straw into gold because, if I recall correctly, some ladies. Dad was bragging and said he could, and then the the feudal lord said, "Fine, I shall have this woman, and she she shall create you know gold, and I assume heirs for me." And then as she was sobbing, like, uh, "How am I gonna do yeah, this?" Yeah, some demons like, "Yo, I'll sort this out, but you got to yeah. give me all your babies." And, and say my um, name thrice. Is that was that a rumble still? You have to guess. You have to guess yeah, his name to, to banish him. Name. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And um. Yeah. What's it called? Uh, what I mean, you, like weave things into literally textiles, like that. That a loom. spinning a loom. Yeah. She was using a spinning wheel. It was a spinning was, wheel? Oh, yeah. yeah. A spinning wheel. Turning uh, flax into gold. They made like a contract where she was like, yeah, if you do this work for me, I'll give you my child. And then once she had a child, she just changed the deal, like sent him, like banished him back to hell and then kept what the baby, jerk. kept the gold. You owe that and man a baby. But yeah. Rumpelstiltskin is the villain <laughs> from that story. Is he? He yeah. absolutely. I mean, you I know. Mean, now that we we, yeah, we, we but, get this like uh, <laughs> breakdown, I'm, I wonder: is he the real yeah. villain? Yeah, I don't think he got due process. Right. It's like you know, he I saw Constant- someone in need. He's like, "Yo, I got you, but you're gonna have to give me this one thing, then, all right? Yeah, <laughs> sign a deal. Cool. We're you cool. I got some you need. You got some I need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I just needed someone for a podcast. I, I go to Christina for my paycheck in two weeks. She. <laughs> Call security. I get dragged out by goons. That's, that's the story of Rumpelstiltskin. Um, Maybe he'll appear and be like, yo, I got you, all right? We're going to take care of this for but you. What bro. I love is the person who's like me. A, like I'm imagining like a younger beer enthusiast who's like, I'm trying to get on this BJCP train, this Cicerone train. Like, where am I going to find a Dortmunder export? Like, crap. Like, all these dusty bottles are like beat to crap. I'm I'm not gonna really be able to describe this beer flavor. I'm like, hmm, it tastes like green glass and <laughs> dust. It's um, like light and dust. Yeah. So you look up Dortmunder Exports and you're like, Oh my gosh, I love Hen House. Like they make one. So I'm gonna get this beer and kind of get a little bit of familiarity with it. And then as you're drinking it, you're like, Oh my god, I've been cramming on SRMs. This is such a good joke and no <laughs> one's gonna get it except for me and the other people like me out there. Um I just I love that it's it's super fun. Uh, yeah, I'm coming for the king. Dortmunder to pills. I am stronger than you, and you don't have the minerals. Yeah, that's 100 percent facts. Yep, everything there is true. Mm-hmm. It's a, a stronger hot beer, water the, profile. You have, add, yeah. um, you have to get you have to add mineral to the water to make it a Dortmunder because Dortmund has mineralized water. Yeah, yeah. Right? The reason so, it's called Dead Canary is a historic mining town. Right. Mineral rich right. aquifers. Wow. Yeah. 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 Folks, if you're l- reading one of our cans and you don't get the joke. Feel free. Email me, Bob, at henhousebrewing.com, and I'll walk you through it. You might not laugh, but at least you'll understand why we think we're so funny. And you're coming away knowing who got married at the first Oktoberfest. Yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah. All right, Bob. Dabbing since way before it was cool. Parentheses 1888. Yes. Um, the, the DAB Brewing Alliance is where most of the Dortmunder exports you will find dying on shelves originated and this is um i think with off the top of my head i'm gonna say it's like a it's a group of like six or eight breweries all part of the dortmunder union and cranking out all this delicious stuff it still exists both i mean these are buildings you can walk into this is a legal entity that is still creating beer and they all got together all the way back in the uh, 1880s very impressive i love seeing um long-lived business and they really talk about how while they all really make the same thing all of their brewers kind of have their own like personalities i honestly i cannot imagine the the variance between these beers that probably a room full of 85 year old german brewers are all holding things that look identical to me but they see the difference in all of them and they're like wow just like i can go i could probably blind taste a bunch of different Petaluma burritos and be like, yeah, you know, some days I'm in the mood for um, El Roy. Some days I'm going to Mi Pueb. Some days I'm going to El Gallo. Like, but to a bunch of Germans who've never been to California, they're like, yeah, it's your big tortilla log that you all like so much over there. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) To me, I'm like, they're all very different. Don't you get it? Yeah, I'm not in the mood for that. Yeah. Very exactly the same thing as the other exactly the same thing. Yeah. I wonder what other like uh, groups these DAB folks were a part of. Maybe Masons? Maybe 
Illuminati. I mean, they predate all of that. Okay, never mind. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I think they're we're they're, we're talking socialist here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Also wrong. (laughs) I was just trying to connect it to other brands. (laughs) Sorry, Uh, I don't know history. It is is like akin to a secret society in a way. Yeah. Right. I always forget what the A was. The D is Dortmund. The B is Brewery. I forget what the A is. And then we got Middle Fru's True Love. That's a less difficult one to get, but uh, the hops of Middle Fru. Uh, that have become very famous by way of Pilsner. The first place I think they were kind of assumed to be included, no matter what, was in the Dortmunder. And then our Chug reference. I'm pleased to hear how many people this beer has taught about Chuginess. <laughs> Bless you, Indie Darling label. <laughs> yeah, keeping us all hip. <laughs> Barely. That's hip, right? Saying I'm, you're pretty hip? Sure, I'm pretty sure learning about Chugi from a beer label is mad Chugi. <laughs> I, yeah. I, yeah, after reading a Chug, I'm like, yeah, I'm a Chug. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, I know what, now I know what I am. I, re- I learned. What is this thing? Oh, that's oh, me. Me. <laughs> Josh, I feel like you and I might even be a little safe. Like, we might be outside of the target of Chuginess. It's like... Uh, how do you oh, yeah, tell chug. me why? <laughs> the, the, yeah, I think everybody at this table is actually too old to be chug, eh. except for you, Fridge. Fridge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Fridge is definitely not too old to chug, but the rest of us <laughs> for certain. Chug, 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 chug. <laughs> On the chug train. <laughs> There's a good list of chuggy examples from Nick. <laughs> In the in the Black IPA podcast, <laughs> yes, there. Are, yeah, I love it. That's a funny, funny enough word to. I just want to hear it more. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think we. I don't know if we covered the beer at all, but uh, we talked a lot. It's delicious. Yeah, I think we did. Cool. Any darlings? Another unruffled in the bag. And now, sensory first. Welcome to Sensory First, where we take a deeper dive into the recipe formulations, rationale, and ingredient selections of the beers of the Henhouse Brewing Company. I am Bob from the Marketing Department, here with the incredible Zach Kelly, Brewmaster. Brewmaster. And we are talking about our newest lager, Indie Darling, this Dortmunder Export Style Lager. Lovely, light, drinkable, just some pretty straightforward malt here. I would hope so. This is a beer style that is not brewed with lactose and puree. Uh, It is not barrel aged. It is just a great lager meant to be enjoyed. Yeah, taking a hard right turn from our usual, uh, we didn't even dry hop it. Yeah, like making a real German lager. We still whirlpool hopped it, but we have to. You still got to rub. You still got to rub a little bit of your, your own essence on it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, uh, you know, we didn't do it with Strata. We used Hallertown Middle Fru, a fabulous German hop that's been uh, making lagers pop for yeah. centuries. Yakima Valley hops would want you to know that it is the Kaiser of German hops. Ah, I love that. You know, definitely a uh, very, very classic hop. You've probably had it in a lot more uh, beers than you would have realized, especially if you're a German beer person, uh, you know, of the noble hop variety. Earthy, uh, somewhat neutral, very, very pretty and subtle. A bunch of heirloom malts, which... We've talked about very recently. Um, yeah. Barco Munich, um, which is, you know, an heirloom old fashioned malt. Uh, all the Barco line is a little bit less modified, a um, little bit less conversion, therefore, and a little bit more like residual sweetness and flavor, too. And then we've got Ericlea Pilsner. Am I saying that right? I think you're saying it perfect, I'm and s- nobody does. That was great. I'm saying it the best, the best of my ability. Yeah. Which is another Bavarian German malt, so trying to, trying to keep this one traditional as possible through and through. Si. Un lager alemán autentico. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah, this is just a great crushable beer. I am really excited to see how this one does and see how people react to it. It's just a little bit darker. It's got a little bit more meat on its bones than the average Pilsner. And um, I'm getting a big kick out of it. Uh, Harvest Yeast doing all the work here. This is pretty much our go-to lugger selection yeast from Imperial. And at some point, I got to look up where Imperial got that yeast from. I actually don't know. I just know we've always had a good time with it. Yeah, I've never, I've never asked them personally. But it, it's a fun beer. It's 
going to be interesting to see how how people react to like getting back towards that like slightly darker color slightly less crisp beer i feel like yeah you know if the uh beer scene and beer memes are to be believed we are back in an age of crispy boys and now we can right slowly move back towards something a little more floral and a little bit more nuanced i'm going to always say that pretty much my favorite style is a very sharp peppery pilsner um and this is you know starting to take those steps backwards towards towards more of a a munich malt focus like a little bit sweeter a little bit more more full-bodied yeah uh, but still you know very pale and crushable right very pale very crushable six percent abv which may be shocking to a lot of German lager fans. But if you were drinking Mm -hmm. Weekly Beer Name Generator, our most recent German lager before this one, you will know that a lager can be strong. It can have a normal to elevated level of alcohol, even higher if we're talking Doppelbach. But this is much more crispy and crushable than our Doppelbach was. Yeah, very, very soft mouthfeel, nice round. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's a lager, you know? Classic style, classically brewed. Yeah, great nose, drinks well cold. This is a lot of fun. I look forward to continuing to enjoy this fabulous beer throughout the rest of the springtime, heading into the summer season. Uh, anything you want to add about this fabulous beer? Nah, drink it. It's good. Drink it. It's any darling. You'll enjoy it. Cheers. House Unruffled was created by Anna Scott. We record at Hen House Brewing Company's Palace of Barrels in Petaluma, California. Our producer is Brian Henderson, and our associate producers are Josh Staples and Fridge. The music you've been listening to was written and performed by our San Francisco account rep McLean from his album Speechless and Speechless 2, which you can find on Apple Music, Spotify, Tidal, and anywhere one finds dope music. If you have a question or comment about this or any episode of Hen House Unruffled, please let us know by calling 707-347-9425 to leave a message. You can also send an email to podcast at henhousebrewing.com. For more information, visit www.henhousebrewing.com or stop by one of our Bay Area tasting rooms. The voice you've been listening to is Imani Russell Black. Please listen and drink responsibly. 